it is now my great pleasure to launch with uh, my esteemed colleague from UNESCO, the Broadband Commission for Digital Development. This commission will be chaired by President Paul Kagame of Rwanda and the co-chair by with uh, Carlos Slim Helu, honorary uh, lifetime chairman of Group Ocarso. Because of their very busy schedules, neither of the two chairperson could not be here with us today, but they send messages. Yeah, yeah. The, the, Mr. President Kagame sent us uh, a message that is uh, says this way. Let us make no mistake. Broadband is going to shape and define the 21st century. Indeed, the transformational power of broadband on people's lives and global economies is now a given. The challenge remaining is to extend these benefits to the majority of the world's citizens in order to enable them to unleash their creative potential to fully integrate in the information-driven global economy. This will require new frameworks for cooperation in the areas of investment, research, and technology. The Brunbad Commission for Digital Development will work to realize this potential. So this is uh, part of the message that was sent by President Kagame, whether we thought that's relevant for you here in this, uh, in this uh, press conference. Um, I'd like to thank President Kagame for sending that message, and I'd like now to go to a video message from uh, Mr. Carlos Slim Elu. Buenas tardes. Me da mucho gusto que la Unión Internacional de Telecomunicaciones, la ITU, en su, por sus siglas en inglés, esté formando con sentido de urgencia esta comisión para que de una manera global se pueda impulsar la banda ancha en, en el mundo. El, eh, la broadband, como se le conoce en inglés, eh, constituye sin duda dentro de la red el sistema nervioso de esta nueva civilización y el acceso de la población a, a la banda ancha constituye una de las prioridades nacionales que esta eh, sociedad tecnológica ofrece. Es muy importante que esta banda ancha constituya un servicio universal de gran calidad para toda la población y a costos muy bajos. La banda ancha no constituye una brecha entre países, sino un puente entre eh, los países rezagados y los países desarrollados que eh, permitirán de manera más rápida acceder a lo que ofrece una sociedad eh, más avanzada, moderna, eh, y que sin duda para el bienestar de la sociedad y de la población en general es fundamental. Es impostergable que todos los países impulsen y apoyen la, pues, el acceso a la red a toda su población. Me vuelvo a, a insistir en la importancia de que con sentido de urgencia se haya constituido esta comisión, de la cual me da mucho gusto formar parte. Muchas gracias. Dr. Turey, just back to you for uh, a little bit more information on this new commission. Yeah, I would like to thank the interpreter for uh, trying hard to get us to, to hear this uh, uh, the message. I'm personally taking Spanish courses, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was uh, very much delighted to hear some of the, to be able to Yes, some of the things that I'm practicing these, uh, these days. Uh, thank you very much again. I know this, we apologize again for the sound quality uh, because of the sound between video and the interpretation. It, would, it was difficult. Sorry about that. Uh, I would like just to say that the commission is a joint initiative of ITU and UNESCO. And uh, Irina Bokova and myself, the Director General of uh, UNESCO, and myself will be acting as vice chairs. Uh, we have the full support of the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, and we will report to 2010 MDG Summit in November, on November 20th. We hope to have a side event in New York on the 19th with heads of states present in there to ensure that we are as abrusive as possible because we really believe that uh, our broadband will enable us to uh, uh, to harness the benefits of uh, information society 
only if it is put on the national agenda of every country. And therefore, we hope to convince the national political leaders uh, to get on board with us on this. And we are very much uh, delighted to have the support of President Kagame, who has shown leadership in the broadband in his own country, and therefore will help us uh, uh, in this endeavor. I would like now to hand the floor to my friend, Mr. Khan, Dr. Khan, uh, to hear his comment about uh, why UNESCO is partnering with IQ in this important initiative. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Um, first of all, uh, let me say how happy I am to be uh, launching this Broadband Commission for Digital Development together with uh, Secretary Thure, uh, a long-standing partner uh, with UNESCO throughout the process of the WSIS. The rollout of broadband, a great technological advance, is a very exciting proposal that has the potential to greatly improve the lives of the people all over the world. As the United Nations Lead Agency for Education, Science, Culture, Communication, and Information, UNESCO, UNESCO's main concern is that this new technology advances development and enhances the human rights everywhere. In other words, our organization sees this cutting-edge technology as a means to an end, not an end in itself, as the Secretary General mentioned in his opening remarks. We view information and communication technologies, especially broadband networks and broadband-enabled applications, as tools to speed up progress on an array of internationally agreed objectives, including the Millennium Development Goals and the Education for All Goals. These important goals, such as poverty eradication and universal education, are supposed to be met by 2015. This is less than five years away. Some time is, therefore, the time is of real essence. As the Secretary General said, many people wonder if these targets are going to be met. And even at UNESCO, we, during our discussions and debates, this, this is often discussed. But the question is really not whether or not these goals can be met, how these goals should be met. And I believe that technology can be a very strong ally. That is, I, I've often said that technology brings the multiplier effect to everything that organizations like mine do. The latest digital technologies have created new opportunities for the education, for the creation of knowledge, for preservation, dissemination, and use of information that people in the developing world must have equal access to. Broadband networks and broadband applications must be equitable and affordable, and they must speak to populations in a language that they understand a point that I made in my earlier intervention as well. People need to learn how to use technology to get full advantage from it. They must also be taught how to transform the information obtained from broadband applications into knowledge and understanding that will empower them in their day-to-day -day lives. This is what we mean when we refer to knowledge societies. In other words, societies in which social and economic development are driven by populations themselves. UNESCO will also propose to guide the Commission in the creation of effective programs, and we will allocate resources for priority groups and geographical areas. These include all, the, all of Africa, the least developed countries, small island development states, marginalized groups, indigenous people, women, and girls. And to that, I may also add people, ICT for people with disabilities. UNESCO is also supporting member states in the development of information and communication technology strategies and broadband enable applications for knowledge acquisition and sharing. These would be considerably enhanced by the wide deployment of broadband networks. I'm confident that Broadband Commission for Digital Development will do much to spread the benefits of 
broadband to populations everywhere. Let me reiterate Dr. Toure's appeal to government, the private sector, and the civil society everywhere to support the Commission's efforts in their own endeavors. Thank you, Secretary General. Dr. Toure, back to you just for some closing remarks, I think, before we open for questions. Yeah, I just want to, uh, I think most of the information has been said by my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Khan. And uh, I would like to just say that uh, broadband, broadband will be uh, important. I do believe that broadband will not replace uh, the services and applications that is supposed to be putting into service. Uh, indeed, it will help them achieve their goals. Uh, uh, we can only do that uh, in an inclusive manner and we are simply delighted to have UNESCO as a partner, our first partner that will show the importance of this element and how they can benefit from it. And we hope to, to call on all other partners to join us in this endeavor. Uh, we hope that by the end of this process, every single country will have a national broadband initiative and a, a national broadband policy. Uh, we uh, believe that uh, uh, broadband networks can pay for themselves uh, with, with less than 3% of savings in, this, in the different sectors that they are putting, uh, putting, and therefore there is a need for a new financing mechanism to be put in place for that. The, in conclusion, I will just say that the, the first decade of the millennium, of the new millennium, was dominated by mobile growth. And we will reach the 5 billion mark this year, some way, midway after June, 5 billion mobile users in the world. Uh, but the second decade of this millennium will be dominated by broadband, and especially mobile broadband, as people will be always on the move, always connected. and. Uh, uh, information will have the same value as water, food, or transport, or energy. So this is my concluding remark. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Touré. And I've just been told that the Broadband Commission website has just gone live. The address is www.broadbandcommission.org. There we go. So let's open the floor to questions now on the Broadband Commission, uh, if we have any. Yes, Steve. I have a question for the Secretary General. Um, concerning policy and regulatory coexistence in a broadband domain, I know it sounds rather specific, but um, over the last few years we've seen the emergence of national broadband policies in a very fragmented way, but certainly governments and politicians have been very uh, forthright in pushing some initiatives forward in a deregulated marketplace, uh, privatized usually as well as deregulated. Uh, last month we saw um, the FCC having a major hassle with uh, US courts on the basis of net neutrality and uh, effectively uh, being told it does not have a mandate, currently not have a mandate for uh, broadband regulation or broadband policy. How do you feel, do you feel that the um, regulatory environment will have to change or somehow accommodate? And, and if so, how do you impose a broadband policy in a country which is fully deregulated and fully com competitive in, in terms of, of marketplace? What power and how, what is the policy shift required? Yeah. This is a, a very good question. It's exactly the type of policy shift we've seen uh, in the beginning of the uh, year 2000 when we had a number of countries with a national regulatory authority put in place, with the uh, regulatory and policy framework that has been put in place for mobile growth. Uh, at the time when we were putting uh, in place many national uh, regulatory authorities, uh, competition was a taboo world in many countries, and uh, this is the case now, which is, it is, it is a fact of life. Uh, private, private, uh, private sector was a taboo world, a world uh, at the time, and uh, private sector is now well recognized in the in the value chain of the and the and in the ecosystem. 
of the uh, of, uh, mobile growth. Uh, thanks to the good regulatory framework that has been put in place, the players have been able to compete uh, with uh, predictable rules and regulations, which uh, rules and regulations that were uh, conducive to more competition. That's exactly what we want to do in the uh, broadband side. Uh, certainly, we'll, we have to adapt regulation and uh, uh, policy to the new uh, technological evolutions if we want to give it a boost. Uh, in fact, the world regulator is not even the right one because it's not the regulators. They're not regulating. They are boosting. They are enabling. They are enablers. Uh, so that's what we should, we, we should uh, move into. Our role in this thing is to try to make sure that uh, countries don't have one to reinvent the wheel, two they would not should, shouldn't make mistakes that have been made already. Uh, we should make the power of information at our disposal to share those information, best practices, and lessons learned or mistakes made, so that you don't make them again, so that we move fast. And we have shown uh, we've been successful in that in the mobile sector we believe that if we translate that for internet growth for for broadband growth we'll be able to succeed succeed as well it's been a, a winning formula a formula in which we only have winners is no win or lose in this thing and a, a formula where we've seen more partnership between public sector and private sector and you know what when president kagame was approached we are very much encouraged by this the whole evolution. When when we approached President Kagame uh, for this for chairing this uh, uh, broadband commission, the first thing he said he said yes I will accept, but I would like a co-chair from private sector. I mean, can you see the the fundamental mental change? In the past, a political leader wouldn't be able wouldn't, wouldn't even wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't consider a a private sector member at the same level, you know, and this is President Kagame showing his greatness, you know, so showing why he's been an exemplary uh, leader in Africa, who's having big dreams for his continent and trying to put it in place, and therefore we'll have in this commission uh, many people from private sector working hand in hand with public sector. One, the one, one has to understand the concern of the other. And, uh, and so that we can find a solution. Personally, I have a very good experience with this. I, had, I was uh, fortunate to have worked with government and also in private sector. I came straight from private sector to ITU. Now I have intergovernmental inter experience. And I believe that all three, the governments, private sector, intergovernmental, all four, I should add, even civil society, they all have the same goal. And their goals are, com their, their, their jobs, their roles are complementary. If we manage it well, we can have it a win-win for all parties. Yeah. Just let me say that there's um, a list of confirmed commissioners as of uh, 9 a.m. this morning uh, at the back of the room. Also a press release. If anyone picked up a press release on the way in, please pick up a new one on the way out because <laughs> it has been slightly updated since you arrived and the current version is the one at the back of the room now. Any other questions? Yes, Boris. Oh, I, I fear becoming such a close friend of uh, important officials. Um, my question is not uh, crystal clear in my mind, but I still try to phrase it, and it's a little bit of the same nature of the other person who put question. Uh, in the past, it was very easy for ITU to be the parliament of information. It was the parliament of public PTTs. And it was easy for UNESCO to be the parliament of culture because in those days, the prestige of academia, etc., was intact. You yourself said, Mr. Abdul Wahid Khan, that this process, this business has had an impact on UNESCO. And it has a, had an impact on ITU. And it is not enough just to put side by side ITU and UNESCO to become the parliament of the information society, even with the civil society. So what is the impact you see in the coming one, two, or three years on both your organizations, on the collaboration between your organization, and how do you, from an institutional point of view, uh, try to move to be 
that place of defending public interest in a revolution which seems unmanageable? Yeah, uh, first of all, we, we don't, uh, uh, we've never used the word becoming a parliament here. Uh, or we, we probably use a platform for, we are a platform for partnership between both public and private sector, and that has been very widely uh, uh, experienced uh, globally. Uh, this is why we have, uh, as I said, we have uh, the five, the four billion mobile subscriptions today. This is why we have all these standards that enable you to talk with a phone that is manufactured in one country and through through the, uh, and you have a television signal uh, in your living room without uh, any interference. It's it's been a very big global international cooperation for 145 years, and it will continue. And without that you will not be able to manage. You need uh, to manage spectrum, and you make it, you can only manage it globally because the signal you are sending here we could cause an interference in Russia or, or, or in Brazil, or vice versa. Or, and uh, if you launch a satellite, you have to, to, to coordinate with all countries you're covering. You need, you need to, to, to make sure that you're coordinating with existing systems as well, and all is done very uh, uh, nicely here in the union without countries' uh, interest to be contradicting each other in the interest of everyone. Uh, in this collaboration, what I'm expecting, our role is just a, to be a tool, the tool to achieve something. How do we have our dream, joint dream, is that every citizen of this planet be able to educate himself or herself uh, 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 himself or herself uh, 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 directly uh, without moving from his uh, own uh, home uh, uh, environment. These are possibilities that ICT is offering. I hope to have the same dream with uh, the Director General of the WHO. We'll go together to make sure that uh, e-health is a, 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 a something that uh, will enable uh, all citizens of this planet to access any medical doctor uh, in the world you know, the best uh, uh, practitioners in the world uh, without moving from your, your home country. So those are potentials that we, we see to, to each other. So we will be measuring ourselves in measuring that uh, so those millennium development goals in education or in health in, and, and, and or, or other uh, uh, fields are met. And then ICT is just the tool there, you know, and access to information will be uh, is, and is that's defined in the preamble of the WISI summit. The, uh, the preamble of the uh, Tunis agenda said, the knowledge society define the knowledge society as a society where every citizen of this planet has access to information, can use information, create information, and last but not least, share information. And, and that will be the key for it. And you are in information uh, field. You know that information, I always compare it to fresh, to, to fish. It's only good when it's fresh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we need to have fresh information at, at your fingertip. And this is possible due to the uh, uh, advances in technology. Mm -hmm. And therefore, a technology will continue to be the tool. It will never replace the, 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 uh, the practitioners. Maybe Walid well, should probably add something to that. No, um, well, I think you're right, although the, you use the word parliament, and that's not um, perhaps the appropriate uh, terminology. No question, when there, is a, when there is a discussion within UNESCO on cultural diversity, there is always an angle on ling cyber, uh, multilingualism in cyberspace because multilingualism and cultural diversity are directly linked. When there is a discussion on freedom of expression, freedom of expression in cyberspace is a subject that you have to discuss. When you talk about transforming education, clearly, how do you transform education without using the multiplier effect of technology? Unfortunately, it's not uh, still with all the debate and discussion and uh, pervasive use of technology in different organizations, the, the, the adaption or the utilization 
of ICTs is still not so pervasive and not so intensive, if I may use the term, within UN organizations. You know, there is a greater awareness, but for example, uh, you know, the, when, when I often quote a, uh, something from Charles Darwin, he said, it's not the strongest species, not the most intelli intelligent that survive, but those that are most adaptive to change. And in today's environment, if governments, if UN agencies, and civil societies, private sector do not adapt to the changes that are, um, that have implications for the technology, frankly, over a period of time, you'll be left behind. And that is the argument that has to take place within UNESCO. We are, uh, at UNESCO, the communication information sector is one of the youngest has got to be more important simply because it brings greater efficiency in all spheres of UNESCO's work. And that is my firm belief. When I say that, I say that with total conviction, that it is only a matter of time when uh, there will be greater degree of realization that without effective and efficient use of communication information technologies, I don't think we can be where we want to be. Thank you. I think, I think time is pressing on our uh, distinguished guests and uh, we're going to have to wrap up there, in fact. So, Mr. Khan, Dr. Ture, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you everyone for coming along. And I just wanted to remind you that tonight there will be a reception at ITU's Montbrion restaurant. Uh, all media are invited to attend, 6 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>